Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adwan and Dr. Asma, as always, for for this and everything else you do. Um, uh, Radwan, brace yourself. For the first time, I'm going to end optimistically. So three years ago, many noted the formal end of political Islam, when in parliamentary elections in the Arab world, the ruling Islamist party in Morocco, the Justice and Development Party, suffered a crushing defeat. Um, where they lost, they went from 125 se seats to 12, far behind the main liberal opponents, the National Rally of Independence and the Authenticity and Modernity Party. Both of those parties were very close to Morocco's royal palace. This development came less than two months after the soft coup, or the coup um, that uh, by Tunisia's president, Qais Saeed, um, putting him against Islamist party and Nahda Let, which led to the removal uh, and ultimately the jailing of Rashid Ghanoushi. Contrary to the case in Morocco, President Saeed removed the prime minister and suspended the elected parliament, assumed the executive power and the power of public persecution, and appointed loyal figures to several critical positions and he barely faced any criticism or pressure from Western democracies. Just after that, the son of the late Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam, announced that he was going to run for president. In Syria, Bashar al-Assad proudly announced that he won elections by 95% of the vote after a decade of war against the Syrian people, which will theoretically allow him to stay in power until 2028, or at least as he prepares his son, Hafiz, to rule after him. Um, and just on a side note, we spoke earlier today about the late Saadidin Ibrahim. I believe it was in a CSID conference that he came up with the term Gumlukeya, which was the moshing together of the republic and monarchy, re resulting in hereditary republics. And so he was reflecting on what he saw about to happen in Egypt with um, Mubarak and his son Gamal, which had just happened in Syria, and what he was kind of foreshadowing in the future. So I just wanted to mention that. In Egypt, the crackdown on the Brotherhood continues, has continued um, with not just the um, death sentence against members of uh, the Brotherhood that are both in exile and in the country, but two years ago the parliament passed a law that enables the government to um, repress arrest um, and put in front of military tribunals any civil servants or citizens that are perceived of as being linked to the Brotherhood. Now these trends suggest two things. First, that the era that enabled political Islamist parties in the Arab world to breathe, participate in politics, and gain power um, among the Arab revolutions is over. And the defeat of the last standing moderate JDP party in Morocco marks a decline of political Islam in the Arab world. But I'm going to challenge that in the end. And second, that the autocratic republic regimes are alive and kicking. With decades of rooted dictatorship, corruption, manipulation, resources, and foreign support, they pro they've proved that they have what it takes to consolidate power against Islamists, against anyone who challenges them, or suggests a democratic alternative. To that end, these regimes have applied different tactics and strategies to get rid of their opponents, their critics, and their rivals. They've created a vicious circle that almost makes it impossible to escape. And ultimately, after a decade of the eruption of the Arab Spring revolutions, Arab governments have managed to oust the Islamists from, as the main scene, from the main scene in, in one way or another. This is not to say that Islamist parties were perfect. Compared to other Arab parties, yes, they were generally more organized and better connected. But in the end, just like other parties, they existed after long periods of repressive, dark moments and environments controlled primarily by regimes that led them to have several shortcomings. I'm not going to focus on that. That's in my forthcoming book. While some of them defended, defied sincere and honest advice that was given to them even, even by um, Dr. Ghanoushi and committed several grave mistakes, others showed pragmatism and a better understanding of the political game. Yet ultimately, these parties couldn't survive for both internal and strategically external reasons. This comes at a time where the view of new types of relations and realignments are actually taking place in the Middle East today. In the Biden post-Trump era countries that were historically in opposition over the past decade until very recently, like Egypt and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Qatar are opening up, making efforts at reproachment and taking and trying to explore opportunities to normalize relations. Now these ref reflect a new geopolitical and regional uh, moment, and also raises questions about the fate of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in the future. 
Now, for so long, these regimes have promoted a discourse that portrays the Brotherhood as the greatest challenge to stability and prosperity in the region and the biggest threat to their nations and to Western interests. Now, following this logic, now that the Islamists are not in charge and far gone, things should be very rosy in these countries. But they're not. The main reason is that the Brotherhood has not been really the biggest problem in the Arab world. It's the Arab regimes themselves and their supporters that might be the problem. Political and economic security indicators in the Arab world, along with state of freedoms and high unemployment rates and the level of repression, and they're currently much worse compared to previous times. And it's expected to continue to get worse if we stay on the current course. And as I've been saying for years here at CSID conferences since 2013, repression has never led to long-term stability. Hence, if there's a will, whether it's the Islamist parties or the Arab regimes, to learn from the past, to grasp the, grasp the right lessons, to fix things, then it might be now that's the right time to do it. So I have a couple of reflections on these terms democracy and Islamism. Is political Islam or Islamism or the era of Islamist politics over? For a while, I thought so, until pre pretty recently. The regional world order has shifted, and so have the sources of the narrative of Islam and politics. While much of has been written about the changing role of the US as a global power, President Biden and his administration have made repeated statements about reclaiming the US position as the leader of the free world and the promoter of democracy, and this has come amid growing authoritarian trends across the globe, in part due to increased influence of countries like Russia and China. But one facet of American foreign policy and the grand strategy to remain unaffected um, by this renewed effort to promote democracy is the U.S. approach towards the Arab world. The Biden administration has been taking a lukewarm stance about this thing called democracy. And although it emphasizes democracy to its foreign policy, it has essentially refused to hold human rights violators accountable, even when they affect and persecute American citizens. The Middle Eastern exception to the American democracy promotion strategy remains, and there seems to be little appetite among American decision makers to apply the same ideals of sustainable global, global order to this region. Citizens of the region are aware of the failed democratic strategy and blatant hypocrisy. They don't believe the US is the bulwark against authoritarian forces. And that is much more apparent today than the results in the results of the last, the eighth Arab Opinion Index conducted by the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. And here's where it gets interesting. According to the survey report, given everything I just said, the percentage of Arabs who think that democracy is the best system of governance for their countries has grown from 67% in 2011, just after the revolutions, to 72% in 2022. And so this doesn't mean that they, that they see the role of the US in helping the region achieve its democratic principles. They don't. 78% consider the US as the biggest source of threat to instability in the region. By contrast, 57% think that Iran is a threat to stability in the region, and 57% also think that Russia is a threat. So given this increase, 72% commitment to the idea that democracy is the governance structure of the future, 78% of them don't believe that the US is promoting that, or, or, or is actually a bigger threat to that. Now, American policymakers should consider what these numbers apply, that the US reputation is so bad and so synonymous with hypocrisy that Arab respondents view actors like Iran and Russia as less threatening. The Arab world continues to be rife with levels of instability. Arab regimes are largely failing to provide basic services and guarantees to rights, and Arab citizens understandably see no benefit from American leadership on the world stage. Such widespread attitudes not only might undermine American interests in the region, but also pose risks to border, broader security of the international system. And all of this data was collected before October 7th. As American legitimacy deteriorates, this leaves a vacuum for other powers like Russia and China to advance their interests and their anti-democratic ideologies in the Arab world and across the globe. 
Moreover, the prospect for democracy could become less attractive when the primary advocates of this, the US, is seen as hypocritical. This signals that there must not be a Middle Eastern exception to US policies on global security and prosperity. Now, on religiosity, according to the Arab Barometer Project, the Middle East and North Africa has seen an increased level in religiosity, particularly among youth over the last five years, more so than pre and post Arab Spring. What these implications might have, what might they have for the region? Does this rise in personal religiosity correspond with changing views on the role of politics and religion? And might this foreshadow the revival of some kind of political Islam across the region? Now, the results of this seventh wave of the Arab barometer suggest that political Islam is making a comeback. That in most countries surveyed, citizens, both young and old, demonstrate a clear preference for religion having a greater role in politics. This is the first time that support for political Islam has increased in any meaningful way since the Arab Spring, just in the past two years. Now, although these trends might not continue, if they did, political Islam could regain its importance as a major political force in the region. Despite the electoral successes of Islamist movements in 2011, political Islam was not widely supported across the region at that time. In 2012 to 2014, no country surveyed did a majority of citizens favor religion having decision making in government. In essence, the questions ask if religion should play a greater role in politics, and today the overwhelming answer is yes. Might this return to a moment of opposition provided for the greater appeal of political Islam. Data from this barometer strongly suggests that this is possible. Since 2018 to 2019, the support for the ideologies of political Islam have been on the rise. And in 2021 to 2022, roughly half or more than five to 10 countries surveyed have said that religion should have a role in democratic decisions in government. While youth, 18 to 19, led to the return, uh, led the return to religion across the MENA, the rise in support for religion and politics is more widespread across society. In most countries, both older and younger members of society are shifting their views. Youth are more positively dispositioned toward the role of religion and politics. For those who are 30 years and older, the results are relatively similar. Now, age matters because in the first bracket, 18 to 29, they don't have a deep memory or any memory of Mubarak and the Muslim Brotherhood as a banned opposition party or the Muslim Brotherhood social services that people argue which led to their popularity. These young people don't have a reference point of that. And so overall, these results suggest that support for political Islam is actually on the upswing. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that political Islam as an ideology will grow into a popular movement as it did in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and as I chronicle in my monograph, yet this data does show that there is a rise in religiosity that's observed over the past five years, and that it's possible, perhaps, that the trend could be reversed, or that it may or may not lead into a political opposition. But we need to understand what all of this means. These indicators are more new, and they need to be understood. But what's really important, I think, is that in the past few years, there are two trends. First, the support for democracy as a system of governance, even without the United States as a model, and a shift that religion should play a role in politics. While causality is unclear, and this shift may not be due to the success or failure of Islamist parties of the past, but these are things that we need to keep in mind as we move forward, as we continue to talk about this region, because as we talk about it as people from the outside looking in, the people on the inside might be telling us a different story. Thank you.